On behalf of the entire Bayina team, we wish you Eid Mubarak. Taqabbal Allah minna wa minkum. May Allah accept it from us and from you. A special thank you to the wonderful community here at the European Islamic Centre in Oldham, Greater Manchester for hosting us this month and making Eid a special one. Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Allah Akbar Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd Alhamdulillah we've concluded a remarkable month and Allah has given us the opportunity in his decree to be able to start and finish the most important time of the year an opportunity to earn our forgiveness an opportunity to start over again what I wanted to dedicate this uh, discussion with you today, this reminder with you today on is two fundamental things. The first of them is the conflict that we're all feeling this month of Ramadan, and particularly at this time of Eid, which is supposed to be a time of celebration. But because what's going on in Gaza and other significant places where Muslims are being oppressed in unthinkable ways, like the Uyghur Muslims in China, like what's happening in Yemen, when you think of those atrocities, it's hard to feel like celebrating. And it's hard to feel like this is a time where Muslims should be feeling happy. Somebody asked themselves, how can I feel happy when all of this is going on? But that's not the only thing. Sometimes, even if there's no tragedy going on, which there are right now, there are genocides taking place at the moment, but even if they weren't taking place, sometimes there are things happening in our own life. There are things happening, a tragedy is happening in your own life, a difficulty you're going through, you don't feel like celebrating. So nobody's life is free from difficulty. What I wanted to start with <clears throat> is a little bit of history, something we should all appreciate about what we are celebrating. Ramadan, the instruction for Ramadan, Allah gave it to the Prophet wasallam when he moved to Medina. Arguably, this was just before Badr time, actually, that the month of Ramadan was revealed. So it's very, very early on in the move to Medina that the Rasul ﷺ received the instruction and the revelation came about this is the month that we should be fasting and the instructions were revealed in Surah Al-Baqarah. I want you to think about who was listening to these instructions. The Muhajirun and the Ansar, there are two groups of Sahaba. There are those that left their homes and they came with the Prophet ﷺ, the, the migrants, we call them the Muhajirun, and those who were helping them and giving them housing and taking care of them and giving them new hospitality and new homes, those were the Ansar. Let's think about the Muhajirun for a moment. Many of them left their families behind, didn't they? Many of them were tortured, beat and humiliated and then not only all of that, they left, they lost their properties, their business, everything, and they came to Medina. That's not so, that's easy to read. But if you and I had to go through something like that, the pain of that doesn't disappear. It stays with you. Many of them lost family members in Mecca that were beat to death or tortured to death. This also happened among them. And they still carry that pain. And of course, even among them is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who loves his people. He loves them. He loves them. And of course, we love people. But the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam had this special love for humanity, particularly his own people. And among them, of course, we have more love for our own family. So he has extra love for for his own family. And within his family are people like Abu Jahal and people like Abu Lahab, who are causing him more pain than anybody else. And he carries that pain too. There's not just one, there are multiple tragedies that have already happened. There's not just one. One after the other, after the other, after the other. That's just from the Muhajirun's perspective. 
But then the, there's the Ansar perspective. They're very happy that the Prophet ﷺ has moved to Medina. They're, they're singing praises, they're thanking Allah that they're being honored to host the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. A good number of them have accepted Islam and they're ready to make sacrifices to welcome these muhajirun. But they're not rich people. They're not well off. They barely have enough to get by themselves. The Quran describes them as وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصَةً they give other people preference over themselves even though they're starving. They themselves are starving. So now they are in this new difficulty, but there's another problem for them, the Ansar. Not only are they economically in a difficult situation and they have to sp sponsor and support and completely carry entire new households. On top of all of that, by supporting and giving refuge to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and, and the muhajirun, they have made a new enemy. The Quraysh has become their enemy because from the Quraysh's perspective, you're giving my enemy support. You're giving my enemy refuge. So now they've made the most powerful tribe in the entire region, the most economically powerful tribe, the most feared tribe, the most respected tribe is the Quraysh. And now automatically the Ansar, who are not a military power, have now made the most powerful enemy in the entire region just for helping the Muhajirun. That's what's happened. And pretty soon, soon war is going to be at their doorstep. They have invited not just the Sahaba, they have invited war to their doorstep. And there are go there's going to be Badr not too, 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 too long later. Then there's going to be Uhud. Then there's going to be Ahzab. There's going to be multiple military engagements that they didn't have to worry about war before, but all of a sudden, this new crisis has come their way. And in fact, in the in Badr, Uhud, Ahzab, if you take stock of the shuhada, if you take stock, if you take the numbers of people that were killed in battle from the Muslim side, actually the larger number is the Ansar. It's more of the people of Medina who were killed. So they carry the pain also of loss. But if you fast forward a little bit more, and of course, Ramadan was revealed, Muslims were fasting, and Allah revealed that we're going to celebrate at the end of Ramadan, and they celebrated. With all of that pain, they celebrated. Then Uhud happened. And in Uhud, unlike Badr, 70 of the leaders, very important people of Quraysh were killed in Badr, but 70 approximately a very influential and important Sahaba, including the Prophet's uncle, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Hamza radiallahu anhu, were slaughtered in Uhud. Not only were they killed, their bodies were mutilated, cut open. That's what they did with them. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in excruciating pain. In fact, he was even injured himself. From, according to some reports, he was injured in three places on his face alone. Like there were, there were spears that went through his jaw that had to be removed. The blood wouldn't stop coming out of his face and they had to cover it with plaster. And the next week, he's giving the khutbah al Jumu'ah with that on his face. And the people who made the mistake of leaving their position were sitting in the khutbah too. They were listening to that khutbah also. But that year, Ramadan also came. And that year, they fasted. And that year, they celebrated an Eid. Then Ahzab, and a year came where the, our mother, Aisha radiallahu anha, was accused. And for several weeks, the entire Muslim community wasn't going through a physical war, they were going through a psychological war. Imagine somebody saying something about your mother, and it's spreading. They're going through that psychological war, and that year also Ramadan came, and they fasted. And at the end of Ramadan, they celebrated Eid. Year after year after year. And... It's not like any of those years in the seerah. If you study seerah carefully, none of those years you can qualify as happy years. Every one of those years came with massive, massive challenges, massive reasons to be traumatized, massive reasons to be devastated. And it's not like that was a new problem. You're still not fully recovered from previous injuries. They're all piling up. And yet Allah told the believers to celebrate. So what, how are they celebrating? The question is, how in the world are they celebrating? I think that's the wrong question, is what I wanted to dedicate this discussion to. This reminder that I wanted to give you is that that's the wrong question. It's not how could they celebrate. It's why are they celebrating. 
And what are they celebrating? If you understand the answer to those questions properly, then you will understand how. It's the what and the why first. Allah gave the Rasul of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the final message to humanity, the Qur'an. And Allah gave that message thousands of years after Ibrahim alayhi salam made dua when he was building the Kaaba. Ya Allah, send a messenger among them. Rabbana wab'ath fihim rasoolan minhum. Yatlu alayhim ayatik. Wa yu'allimuhum al-kitaba wal-hikmah wa Thousands of years ago, this place was empty. It was desert. There was nothing there. Ibrahim alayhi salam was building these foundations and he made the dua that Ya Allah, because he was building it alongside Ismail alayhi salam from our children when we have many, many, many offsprings many generations later Ya Allah, among them send one messenger who will read your book to them you read your ayat to them teach them the book teach them wisdom and thousands of years later Allah answered that dua and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi came and now Allah told us when he moved to Medina sallallahu alayhi wa Allah told us now it's time for you to recognize that that dua has been answered. Now it's time for you to celebrate the answering of the dua of Ibrahim a.s. Guidance has finally come. Now you know how to live your life. Now you know what is right from what is wrong. Now you know who your Rabb truly is. There are other religions in the world who believe in God and study their concept of God and you will find something twisted and turned in every, every one of them. Study just, forget about the religious rituals and the practices, just study what they think about God. Just what, how they see God and how we understand Allah and what Allah told us about Himself. How He introduced Himself to us. How He purified all of the corruptions that were associated with Him. Some religions had gods, the only way to make those gods happy is you have to sacrifice someone or something. Some gods only happy with one race, not happy with any other race. Some gods, other people, you can't, you, don't, you can't even talk to that god directly. You have to go through somebody else to talk to that god. That's, that's the systems that were in place. And Allah cleansed all of that and connected us to Him directly, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's actually part of the meaning of tasbih, to remove all of the impurities from who, understanding who Allah is. We're celebrating return, the return to the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's what we're saying. Just like he broke all the idols, you know his story? We're actually celebrating that Allah restored the original teachings of Ibrahim alayhi salam and made them permanent until judgment day. That's what we're celebrating. We're celebrating the obedience to Allah on his terms. People didn't know how to make their God happy. So they said, maybe if we kill the first, you know, we kill a baby, then their God, some people sacrifice children to make their gods happy. Other people, you know, dance naked to make their God happy. They, they tried to get creative. What does this God want from us? Because some people wanted rain. They're like, it's, the rain's not coming. We have to have a special ritual to make it rain. Or we're about to go to war. We need a special ritual to, to win this war. What do we do for our God to become happy? And Allah made it very clear to us in His book, what does He want from us? And in fact, first, first he let us know that his relationship with us is not even a transaction. You don't do something for Allah and only then Allah does something for you. It doesn't work that way. Allah provides anyway. In Allah huwa razaq Ma uridu minhum min rizq. Wa ma uridu an yut'imun. I don't want them to provide me. I don't want that they should feed me. Allah is the one who keeps giving over and over again. Allah is the one who gives. So we don't have to go to some temple and make a sacrifice and put it in front of the idol and wait for something good to happen. We don't, we don't need to do that. We could just make dua to Allah who's our raziq anyway. He was providing us before we could even open our mouth. He was providing for us before we could even speak for ourselves. He provides even the disbeliever. This is what Allah does. Allah introduced us to what does He... So it's not that we're in a transactional relationship with Allah, but Allah introduced us to what is it that He finds pleasing. How do you become someone who's content with your Rabb and your Rabb is content with you? The few good things he wants you to do. The few harmful things he wants me to stay away from. He will make good and pure things permissible for them. He will make filthy things um, impermissible for them. That's what Allah gave. He made life easy. Allah said, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ Allah wants to make your burden lighter for you. 
Allah wants to lighten your burden. Life is hard, and when you follow Allah's word, life becomes easier. He wants to remove burdens from you, and human beings were made weak. We make, we make bigger problems for ourselves, and Allah has helped us remove those problems just by obeying Him, just by obedience. And what are we celebrating at the end? Look at the ayah. The, the, the ayah of Ramadan is remarkable. It tells, tells you so many things. By the end of the ayah, when we complete the count of the fasting, which we have, alhamdulillah, Allah says, لتك, لتكملوا العدة So you can complete the count. So you can complete the count. وَلِتُكَبِّرُوا اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَذَاكُمْ So you can declare Allah's greatness the way He guided you. Listen to that carefully. So you can declare Allah's greatness the way He guided you. On the way here, many of you know the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. So even on the way coming to this prayer, you were saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillahi alhamd. We were declaring Allah's greatness. But declaring Allah's greatness is not just words, is it? When we weren't eating all month, even though our body was telling us to eat, when we weren't drinking all month, even though our body was telling us to drink, we were declaring Allah's greatness because Allah was greater than our thirst. Allah was greater than our hunger, wasn't it? Allah was teaching us how He was training us all month to understand what it means that Allah is greater. What does Allahu Akbar mean? Allah is greater than my thirst. Allah is greater than my hunger. Allah is greater than my desire. Allah is greater than my greed. He's greater. Now he, he, this 30 days of training, now we should celebrate, Ya Allah, you made us stronger because any exercise you do consistently makes you stronger, doesn't it? This is an exercise of recognizing the greatness of Allah. You are now stronger and you're more able to recognize Allah's greatness and to live by Allah's greatness than you were before. Waalaikum salam. So now, Young man, come on, it's okay. Come on. I mean, everybody else went. Wave to the camera. We're celebrating that we're ready now to live a life where we can actually live Allahu Akbar. We can live by that. We can actually, any decision I'm about to make, just like fasting, maybe sometimes you forget that you're fasting in the beginning, right? And you're reaching for a glass of water and somebody reminds you, hey, you're fasting. Oh yeah, I forgot. Immediately, Allahu Akbar, isn't it? Immediately. Now, in the rest of my life, any business decision, any communication, any message, any conversation, any dealing, any reaction, right before I'm about to have that reaction, I ask myself, oh wait, Allah, Allahu Akbar, okay, I can't do that. I stop myself. I'm celebrating the I've, I've heightened my recognition of Allah's greatness. That's what I'm actually celebrating. And that I can celebrate even if, the, even if my entire life is on fire. Even if there's the greatest crises going on, this gift of guidance, it doesn't depend on whether life is easy or hard. The Sahaba understood something. The Quran made them understand something. You can have any challenge in your life Life can be easy and life can be difficult. And the entire ummah can go through multiple, multiple, multiple crises. But one thing that will never change is that the gift of guidance, the gift of revelation. Remember the way Allah talked about Ramadan. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an hudan lil-nas. That was the beginning of the conversation. This is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. A guidance for all people. We're celebrating that we committed ourselves to this guidance. Every year we're recommemorating that. And it doesn't matter what our circum circumstances are. Even the words that many of you memorize by heart at the end of Surah Al-Asr, وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْ بِالصَّبْرِ What does that even mean? When do you need sabr? You only need sabr when times are difficult. That's when you need it. Otherwise, there's no need for sabr. If times are good, you, you, <laughs> there's no need for you to have sabr. We're actually, even in the surah, we're recognizing that with iman, with good deeds, with speaking out for the truth, comes difficulty. This life is about difficulty. We're celebrating that we're ready to meet that difficulty and we will not disobey Allah when that difficulty comes. That's what we're celebrating. And because we're celebrating that, then even for the Sahaba, no matter what tragedy was going on, they can still celebrate the, the obedience to Allah. Now I'm going to switch to the last part of what I want to share with you today. The last part of what I want to share with you today 
is uh, is difficult to talk about, and that is the way in which we celebrate. The way in which we celebrate. This is a time for families to get together. This is a time for exchanging gifts. This is a time for get-togethers, and it's a joyous moment. But we cannot experience this moment while not being sensitive to those that are in pain. We cannot experience this moment forgetting that there are, we're holding our, I mean, I'm holding my son when I walked in here, my baby. That's when I walked in here. And I'm thinking about all those people that were, hold, that were burying their babies over the last several months. All those people that their, the joy of their life was ripped away from them. They're also believers. And Allah tested them in a way that I cannot imagine. I cannot bear the thought of it, but Allah tested them in that way. And their pain, because we are kajasad, we are like one body, that's our pain too. That's our pain also. So while we celebrate the obedience to Allah, it cannot be completely absent from there is a crisis in the family. There is pain to be suffered. And that pain, even though we're celebrating Eid, we're not going to stop celebrating it because that celebration doesn't have to do with people. It has to do with Allah. It's, it has to do with our worship of Allah. But at the same time, we, we can celebrate Eid and feel the pain at the same time and do something about that pain at the same time. So this last message that I wanted to share with you is about how we celebrate Eid. Unfortunately, a lot of people have bad habits. Inshallah, none of you are from them, so I'm not talking about you. So don't feel like I figured you out. People have bad habits and they're like, I'm going to cut back on this stuff. It's Ramadan, man. I can't. I can't. It's Ramadan. And then when Ramadan's over, Eid Mubarak, and the shayateen are also saying, Eid Mubarak, they just got unchained too. They're like, well, it's not Ramadan anymore. So I think I'm going to go back to some of the old stuff. Maybe not immediately. I'll give it a couple of days. And you end up going back to how things were. And even the way we celebrate Eid sometimes. Because Eid, you know, what happened with the Christian people, with the Jewish people, with other faith traditions, they have celebrations. They have Christmas. They have Hanukkah. They have, they have their celebrations. You know what happened to those celebrations? They became commercialized. Right? So they don't even know why they're celebrating. They just know it's a time where a lot of sale, a lot of stuff is on sale. A lot of stuff comes goes cheap. And there's a lot of lights on, on people's houses. And people dress in, in, in clothes and give each other gifts. That's what they know. And there's a lot, of, a lot of parties. There's a lot of dinners and lunches. There's a lot of extra food. A lot of, you know, that's, that's what they know. That's, that's what it's become. And it's a time of great extravagance. It's a time of going over and extra. For us, the first thing was we're celebrating obedience to Allah. So the problem is, if many of us are going to be celebrating the obedience to Allah by doing things that disobey Allah, like extravagance, like showing off, like being immodest, like being indecent, like clearly disobeying the instructions of Allah and His Messenger وسلم, and then saying, Eid Mubarak. The problem with that is, you're saying, celebrate obedience to Allah Mubarak while you're disobeying Allah. And we're not seeing the irony of that. We're not seeing the irony of that. Now Allah told us, He alluded to Eid in the ayat. He said, So you can declare Allah's greatness the way He guided you. And then at the end of all of that, after, So you can be grateful. You can appreciate this gift of gratitude. The very next ayah is about dua. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّعِي إِذَا دَعَانٌ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُ بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ When my servant, my slave asks you about me, tell them I am near. Then I am near. I respond to the call, the prayer of the one who calls whenever they call. That's Allah's promise. But Allah added something. We forget that part. He said, لي, Then they should try to respond to me too. Listen to that carefully. Here I am asking Allah, Ya Allah, I have a money issue. Help me so solve this. You're the razik, solve my problem. Ya Allah, I have a legal issue. Ya Allah, you're the one who rescues from any karb, any difficulty, any catastrophe. Solve my problem. 
Ya Allah, I have a marriage problem. Ya Allah, I have a child problem. Ya Allah, my son is becoming disobedient. Ya Allah, my health. Ya Allah, my mother. Ya Allah, my father. Ya Allah, the ummah. Ya Allah, this. Ya Allah, that. We're asking Allah every every kind of dua about ourselves, about our family, about the ummah, about dua, 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 dua. And Allah said, I will answer every one of those duas. However, li. Remember the other gods I talked about? They wanted sacrifices? You got to put something in front of the altar, then you get what you want? What does Allah want? He said, they should respond to me. They should try to respond to me. li. What do you mean? So that means I'm asking Allah for something. But now Allah is saying, I've also asked for something. I've also made some demands. That means that I have to know what Allah is asking for. I have to study Allah's book. I have to let Allah speak just the way I'm speaking to Allah. Allah is also speaking to me. He also wants something from me. And he's saying, I'm doing my part. I expect you to do, at least try to do your part. At least try to do your part. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي And they should try to believe in, then they should believe in me. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَلْشُدُونَ So they can be set straight. Maybe there, therein lies the answer to our, our collective question. I can't speak to anybody personally. Sometimes people say, why isn't Allah answering my du'as? But us as a people, us as an ummah, when we collectively d decide that we're not going to respond to Allah, we're not going to listen to Allah, we're going to do things our own way. We're going to turn this religion into something that makes us feel good, Instead of actually this religion being something that is designed, by its design, your, support, your first priority is not your feelings, it's whether or not you're pleasing Allah. This, this religion is not serving you, you're supposed to serve Allah. Every other religion you'll find something, those religions became something that serves the people. They should feel good. When the church saw that not enough people are coming to church, they started a church band. Now more people will come, <laughs> right? We should change the religion to cater to the audience. Even though we don't do that in our masajid, alhamdulillah, the individual can say, yeah, but you know, there are parts of Islam that feel pretty good. Other parts of Islam I can purposely ignore because I, I'm not really comfortable with I don't really like them that much. I'm not going to respond to this part of Allah's book and this part of Allah's book. I'm going to pretend it's not there. I'm just going to part talk about this part and this part and this part. And Allah is very clearly telling us, فَلْيَسْتَجِبُونِي They should try to respond to me. Will you mean be? We want our du'as to be answered collectively. We want Allah Azza wa Jal to give us relief to, to, in our personal lives and across the world in the ummah. Particularly what's on all of our conscience right now and all of our minds right now is the situation in Gaza. And Allah Azza wa Jal give the shuhada Jannah and may Allah bring the oppressors to justice. But having said all of that, we have to do our part. We, we, need, we need to make our dua count. Like our dua has to have value. Our dua cannot just be words. Our dua has to live up to the condition that Allah gave us, that we are celebrating. Now we're actually in a position to make real dua to Allah. We showed Allah, Allah is Akbar for 30 days. Now we know what Allahu Akbar means. Now I'm going to live the rest of my life living up to Allahu Akbar. And now I'm in this position to ask Allah, Ya Allah, I responded to you. And so I'm asking you also. That's actually the deal. That's actually this, this, this guidance that Allah has given us. One last thing as I leave you, in the last minute that I have, before we make the Eid Salah. You know the very next ayah about after Ramadan, the ayat of Ramadan in Surah Al-Baqarah, right after that, Allah Azza wa Jal describes وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا أَمْوَالَكُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ بِالْبَاطِلِ وَتُدْلُوا بِهَا إِلَى الْحُكَّامِ لِتَأْكُلُوا فَرِيقًا مِنْ أَمْوَالِ النَّاسِ بِالْإِثْمِ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ I won't go into details about that ayah. Read, out, read up on it yourselves. But listen, right after Ramadan, the first thing Allah talked about is don't do corrupt things with your money. That's the first thing Allah talked about. It's as if if you've truly understood the greatness of Allah, then you and I have truly understood the importance of being honest and halal in all of our financial dealings. Don't eat somebody else's money using falsehood. Don't lie about what you owe them. Don't scam somebody out of a deal. 
If you're a contractor, don't con your customer. If you're a lawyer, don't lie to the judge to win a case. So you can, your client can win more, win more money. That's Allahu Akbar in real life. It's not just Allahu Akbar when we stand in salah. It's not just Allahu Akbar when we're not eating while we're fasting. Now it's Allahu Akbar in money matters. That's actually the real test. That's the real, and there are people that, are, that, that owe inheritance money to their sister, to their, to, their, uh, uh, to their mother, you know, and they're not giving it. There are people that owe inheritance money, there are people that are not giving mahar to their wife. Money matters. And yet, all of Ramadan they fasted. And Eid they're celebrating. What celebration is this when Allah is not akbar in these things? When you don't respond to these things? And then you say, Ya Eid Mubarak, I'm so happy. I'm so glad, give me a hug. We have to become honest with ourselves. We have to ask ourselves why the Ummah ends up in the state that it is. Maybe, just maybe, it has to do with my personal obedience to Allah before we look at anybody else in the Ummah. Maybe I need to check, where am I going wrong? Where am I not responding to Allah? Because I really want Allah to hear my du'as and I don't want, Allah will not hear something that is insincere. Allah will not respond to something insincere. And this is the height of insincerity. Disobey Allah on the one hand and ask Allah on the other. May Allah Azza wa Jal this Eid grant us all sincerity. May Allah Azza wa Jal truly allow us to celebrate the worship and the obedience to Allah. And may Allah Azza wa Jal bring us closer and closer to His word and put a love and concern for each other in all of our hearts. Marakallahu alayhi wa lakum. Assalamu alaykum. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Wallahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Walillahi alham. Hadi, did you have a good time at Eid? Hey, hey. Hey, everybody, this is Hadid, Hadid Noman Ali Khan, and we're having a good time at Eid. And he's seeing this boy over there play, and he wants to play. <laughs> look at him go. I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna look there too. Hi, baby. Eid Mubarak, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>